Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about impedance measurements and circuit characterization in the simulator by looking at the .NET statement available in LTSpice. Long story short, it's a very simple measurement statement that extracts the common ways of expressing impedance and circuit properties for two port circuits. Using this statement, you will be getting things like input and output impedance and admittance, but also the various S, H, Z and Y parameters, all in one go. You just need to set up the measurement in the right way. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Now, in a previous episode, we looked at how impedance can be measured in the circuit simulator in AC simulations by dividing the injected voltage by the passing current. When doing this, LTSpice will display the absolute impedance and phase shift, and if you want a different way of expression, you can extract the real and imaginary part of this quantity by editing the displayed value. However, when it comes to characterizing more complex circuits, one way to make things easier is to first simplify the circuit into blocks with an input and an output, or just port 1 and port 2, and then express the measurement values in various ways based on what is more convenient for the specific calculation that is needed to be performed. So not just to extract absolute values like impedance, but also relative values, where the circuit is measured in reference to the measurement impedance or ratios between input and output signal. So in this category, we have things like S parameters, where the reference impedance of the two measurement ports are needed. And then the measured values are expressed in reference to these. In real life, this sort of measurements are usually done with a device called a network analyzer. So today we will look at the circuit simulator's equivalent, the .NET statement, which is present in LTSpice. So, Let's start off with how the .NET statement needs to be set up. So you will find some information about this in the help file, so under the .NET entry, and other than this you also have an example circuit, so under the LTSpice examples file path. So to implement this statement, just like with a network analyzer, we need a signal source with an input reference resistance, and then an output port which also needs to have a defined reference resistance. So now let's see how this can be implemented in the simulator. So what you need to do is you need to add the .NET spice directive and define the output load and the input current source. So in this specific order. Once you do this, you simply run the simulation and to visualize the results, you can right click on your plot window, add traces, and here you will get a set of measurement values which appeared thanks to this included new directive. So as you can see, you can have multiple .NET statements running in parallel. So I have about seven at the moment. And the outputted values will be defined in reference to the input signal source. So whatever signal source was used in the .NET definition. The values that you will get by using this statement are an input and output impedance, as well as the input and output admittance, and then the various network matrix results, like your S parameters, Z parameters, Y parameters, and the H parameters. So regardless of what you actually need, all of these will get generated when you include the .NET statement. So now let's have a closer look at how this statement can be implemented. First of all, as a signal source, you can either use current or voltage sources. The only thing to keep in mind is that you need to define the small signal AC analysis amplitude to some value. So just that the simulation knows that this signal source is used for the AC analysis. Now as input resistance, if nothing is defined, then your default value will be 1 ohm. And if this value suits you, then leave it as it is. But if you want a different value, there are multiple things that can be done. So on the one side, you can include the series resistance into the signal source so under the parasitic properties, you can include the series resistance value, or you can define it in the .NET statement. So simply writing in or in equals whatever value you need. So if we check out these three circuit simulations 
and we look at the output impedance, so the impedance seen from the output towards the input, which will be our test circuit, one mega ohm in this case, in parallel with the series resistance of the input signal source. And we also change to logarithmic scales just so we get linear values. If we start with the output impedance of V2, so this circuit where nothing is defined, we can see we are getting a value of 999.99, so this is the default 1 ohm in parallel with 1 mega ohm. If we move to V3, we get a value of 49.99, so this is the 50 ohms series resistance defined in the signal source in parallel with 1 mega ohm. And finally for V4, we get the exact same value. This time the series resistance has been defined in the dot net statement. Now even though both of these circuits give the same results from the dot net statement, they give slightly different results when you look at the general voltages and currents in the circuit. So if we look at the voltage on output 3 and the voltage on output 2, so the two outputs, we can see that for output 3 we get exactly 1, whereas for the other circuit we get 999 point something. So the difference between defining a series resistance in the circuit or in the dot net statement is that if you define it in the dot net statement, then this value will only be applied in the dot net statement. It will not be applied in the rest of the simulation results in the circuit. Now, in a similar fashion to the input resistance, we also need to define the output resistance. So on the one side, if we define the output as current running through an element, so in this case R2, then this output resistance will be taken from the defined element, so 100 ohms in this case, now on the other hand, we can define the output as being a net, so a voltage net, so not necessarily a component. In this case, if no other resistance is defined, then we will get an output default value of 1 ohm, or if we don't like this default value, then we can define an output impedance. So simply adding into the dot net statement an output value, and there's one more case to mention, in which we did define a component, so the current running through R9, R9 having a defined value, but you don't like this value, and for the purpose of your dot net statement, you can define a different value. So when the dot net statement is calculated, the included value into the statement takes precedence over the component value that is in the circuit. So now just to check the response of these circuits, we can look at the input impedance, so the impedance seen from the input port, which will be the test circuit, so 1 mega ohm in this case, in parallel with whatever output resistance has been defined, So for our first case, the input impedance of V1, we have the 100 ohms of the defined component in parallel with the 1 mega ohm present in the circuit, so 99.99. If we move to V6, here we have the 1 mega ohm of the circuit in parallel with the default value, so here nothing was defined, so we got the 1 ohm, so total being 999.99 milli, the impedance of V2 is the 1 mega ohm in parallel with the defined 100 ohms, so 99.99. And finally, the impedance of V5 is the 1 mega ohm of the test circuit, not in parallel with the 1 mega ohm of the defined component, but rather in parallel with the 100 ohms defined in the dot net statement. So again, 99.99. Now, just like with the input impedance, if you define the output impedance in the dot net statement, then this value will only be used for the purposes of the calculation of the dot net statement. So if we just look at the current running through V5, we can see that it's equal to 2 microamps, the 200 mega ohms in parallel being supplied with a 1 volt signal. When it comes to performing such measurements in real life, you have a class of devices called network analyzers or vector network analyzers, which come in more or less expensive, accurate, or complex forms. Regardless, the principles of calibration are needed to account for the test setup imperfections. So like we've seen with the basic one port measurement, you need to perform a short circuit, open circuit and reference value calibration. And with two ports, you also need some extra steps like through calibration when the two ports are directly interconnected to validate how well the signal can get from one port to the other this mainly accounts for any losses in the transmission lines that are used. And you'll also need to perform an isolate calibration when the signal path is interrupted. 
so that you can observe how well the two ports can be ideally isolated. Another thing to mention has to do with the injection point. One very commonly used set of network parameters are S parameters. To obtain a full set for a two port system, you first need to inject a signal into port one and measure what gets reflected back as well as what passes through, so S11 and S21. But to get the other two S parameters, you need to inject a signal from the other side. Now, if your measurement equipment can do this by itself, that's great. But if it can't, then you need to manually swap the two measurement ports. We can first verify this in the circuit simulator. So what I have here is a very basic test circuit using only resistors. So this is a non-symmetrical circuit, so we get slightly different results depending on which way we're looking into it. It's basically a series 50 ohm with a parallel 50 and 100 ohms on one or the other side. So I have the two circuits where the input port on the one side goes into the 50 ohm resistor and on the upper side goes into the 100 ohm resistor. So if we now look at the values for the various S parameters, here on the bottom side I extracted all four of them, so S11, 21, 22 and 12 from the V1 side, so with the first circuit. And first of all we can notice that the S21 and 12 parameters have the same value, so with this sort of circuit this is normal. But here on the upper side I also extracted the S11 and 21 parameters for the second circuit. So here it's no surprise that the 21 value for the upper circuit is the same as the 12 value or 21 value for the bottom circuit. But what we can notice is that the S11 value for V2, 203 million, is the same as the S22 value for V1. So for the upper circuit the S11 value is the same as the S22 value for the bottom circuit. So by swapping the ports we can get the same results, just with the inverted port numbers. So in essence we can measure half the parameters, swap the ports and measure the other half. This in case our measurement equipment has injection related limitations. Next we can confirm our results using a practical circuit. So for that I prepared the resistive network and to measure it I will be using the light VNA network analyzer. Now this is a relatively cheap device. And one of its limitations is that it can only inject signal through one port and measure it through both. So it can only generate the S11 parameter and the S21 parameter. It can't directly measure the other two S parameters. So I've already set it to measure the S11 parameter. I've connected the circuit and we're getting a value of 0.076. If we change to the S21 measurement we're getting a value of 0.387. And now to get the other two S parameters I will simply rotate the circuit. So I've swapped the connections and now the two ports of the circuit have been interchanged. So right now when we're measuring the S21 parameter it's actually the S12 parameter but for the circuit put into the other way. So for this parameter we're getting the same 0.386 value and if we now go to the reflected value, so the S11 which is S22 for the circuit in the other position, we're getting a value of 0.228. So decently close values to what we were getting in the circuit simulator. So this way by rotating the circuit we can obtain the full S parameter matrix. When using new functions in general in LTSPICE and depending on the parameters of interest, it might be useful to make some very basic circuits first just to see what the simulator will output before analyzing a more complex design. You can start with a resistor circuit or something similar just to confirm the simulator is outputting the values that you are expecting. And once the syntax and implementation are understood, you can reliably and confidently move to some more complex circuits. Now if you want to play around with the .NET statement with a more complex circuit without really bothering to build it, you have this ready-made simulation present in the LTSpice library. So this is present in the LTSpice folder under examples educational and it's the sparameter.asc. So here you have a very high order filter, so multiple inductors and capacitors, and you have the .NET statement implemented in multiple ways. So there's five different implementations where either input or output resistances are defined in the statement or in the circuit. 
And well, if you run it, you get the various results for this particular bandpass filter. So if you just want to get started, this is a very good complicated example to have a look at. So this about covers how the .NET statement needs to be set up and used in LDSpice. Now you just need to know how to take advantage of the various results. You will probably not need all of them, but there is a reason why these particular ones were added. These are the most commonly used parameters that define a circuit's AC behavior, so usually what you need is somewhere among them. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.